Welcome to Love and Guilt in the Anthropocene, a podcast to help people and organizations embrace the adventure of climate action. We are envisioning a world where sustainability comes naturally. Welcome back. This is a reading from the blog, uh, the post, A Tangled Mess of Plastics. This Thanksgiving, I'm thankful for plastics and the UN Global Plastics Treaty. A few months ago, Daniela Fernandez, the founder and CEO of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, posted a picture on LinkedIn of a Mars candy bar wrapper from 1986 that was recently found on a beach in the UK. It looked brand new. Fernandez pointed to the UN Plastics Treaty as a good step toward ending the plastics crisis and the environmental damage we're causing. Final negotiations for this treaty are scheduled for November 25th through December 1st of this year and would create an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution. I shouldn't read through the comments section, but I can't help myself. Responses to Fernandez's post included, yes, but this is litter. If people threw things away properly or recycled properly, this wouldn't be a problem. Or yes, but if plastics degrade rapidly, they release CO2, which is bad. It's better that plastics don't degrade. Or yes, but plastics have reduced how much waste people are sending to landfill. Or it's logical alternative. If we weren't using plastics, we'd be sending much more to landfill. All of these yes buts reveal a few pieces of the puzzle. Taken alone, each individual statement is incomplete and represents a dangerous aspect of how humans think. We really love simplicity. But taken together, all of these pieces importantly reveal the complexity of moving towards more sustainable futures. Plastics are complicated. As the comments section of that LinkedIn post shows, plastic and plastic pollution is a complex topic. I recently published a JAMA viewpoint with some colleagues that discusses plastics and plastic pollution in the healthcare setting. It was very challenging to condense the necessary information into the word limit for that journal. But here's what I know about plastics. They are ubiquitous. They are really handy. They have helped shape our disposable culture. They create a lot of emissions when they are produced. They create some health hazards when they are produced. They create some health hazards when they are used. And they create a lot of environmental and health concerns when they are disposed, especially when they are disposed improperly. Recycling of plastics is really hard for individuals and for the whole economic system. Recycling of plastics was also a red herring used by the industry to shift blame away from them and onto individuals. Despite these sweeping statements, measuring the impact of plastics is not straightforward. As some people have rightfully, if in the wrong spirit, pointed out, if we were to use ceramic mugs instead of styrofoam cups, or hemp shopping bags instead of thin film plastic, and still throw them away after each use, that would be way worse for the environment. But the hope is that we wouldn't do that. Moving away from plastics requires a shift, much as moving towards plastics did. We have to rethink how we value these items and how we use them. This cultural and industrial shift will take lots of work from many stakeholders. We must decide as a society where we absolutely do not need plastics and where we absolutely do need plastics, where we don't need plastics. Plastics really exploded into all parts of life following World War II. Before this, people reused just about everything, or their disposable materials were made from biodegradable stuff. Um, Think banana leaves for plates. When my grandma died about 10 years ago, there were at least two cardboard Quaker Oats tubes wrapped in contact paper and used as pencil holders. She was a baby of the Great Depression, and she didn't waste anything. I don't need plastics for most of my household basics. I can take reusable glass containers to the store and fill them from bulk bins. However, I have a co-op with bulk bins within walking distance of my house. I have storage space for the glass containers, and I can financially afford to cook this way. I have both time and money to do so, usually. If we want everyone to switch back to this lifestyle, we have to enable it in some way. We cannot just blame and shame people into it. Where we do not need plastics, we need to find ways to make the cultural shift away from those items. For example, my sister's municipality in the United Kingdom actually gave them tax bonuses to purchase and use reusable nappies or diapers. It saved the municipality on their waste hauling fees if new parents used reusable diapers. This incentive helped break down one potential barrier. There are still others. Where we do need plastics. There are many aspects of life where we would probably do well to keep plastics around. Plastics have been crucial in the manufacturing of lighter weight vehicles, allowing cars to achieve better gas mileage or better battery mileage. Plastics are also essential for many people in differently abled communities. 
People with mobility or dexterity issues may need pre-peeled foods or flexible straws to be able to live independently. Coming from healthcare, I can also see where single-use plastics are crucial for the delivery of medical care. During new disease outbreaks, like the early days of COVID, AIDS, or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, disposable personal protective equipment, or PPE, kept people safe until we could determine how these diseases spread. There are plenty of other examples out there. Where we absolutely do need plastics, we need to minimize the damage that plastics cause. Most plastics are still sourced from fossil fuels. That's a dirty, messy extraction process, and one we hope to move away from because the whole industry causes climate change. On the climate change front, some people argue that plastics are technically a carbon sink because the carbon they contain will not break down and be released into the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. It's technically true, but also short-sighted. It would be far better for climate change if fossil fuels and the carbon they contain stayed stored in the ground in the first place. Recently, there has been a boom on new types of plastics that are not made from fossil fuels. Perhaps you've heard of plastic made from algae. These bioplastics, or biopolymers, are pretty exciting. But plastics made from a renewable source, like corn, sugarcane, wheat, wood, agave, banana, bamboo, algae, and food waste, isn't always biodegradable or compostable. Biopolymers usually have the benefit of reducing upstream emissions from manufacturing, but only about 40% of bioplastics produced are designed to biodegrade. The rest of them behave just like fossil fuel plastics when they're out in the environment. They break down into smaller and smaller bits. And they all have uh, likely additives and other things in them that we are exposed to while using these plastics. These chemicals can disrupt our and other animals' endocrine systems, causing cancer and reproductive issues. We see these tiny bits of plastic showing up everywhere, from the bottom of the Mariana Trench to the inside of human testicles. People who have more microplastics in them are more likely to face adverse health outcomes because that stuff isn't supposed to be there. Patients with visible microplastics in their heart plaques were four and a half times more likely to have a heart attack, stroke, and death within two years. So perhaps we need a way to get rid of plastics, even the ones that seem essential right now. How to improve plastics. Increasing the amount of biodegradable or compostable plastics on the market is a start. There are actually compostable PPE emerging in the healthcare sector. Making plastic products more circular is another solution. This concept means that we retain the value of plastics by using them multiple times. This could be through direct reuse, just clean and reuse. My parents did this all the time with blue plastic spoons from their favorite fast food restaurant. Um, Or reprocessing and refurbishing of products. In healthcare, we have single-use device reprocessing and refurbished equipment markets or through actual recycling, though there are physical limits to plastic recycling. My favorite approach, though, is moving away from plastics wherever possible. Some really innovative people and some intrepid companies are developing new materials that just aren't plastic. It takes a lot of creativity, but it is so cool. Fungi is having a moment as an alternative for packaging, textiles, and other items. Seaweed and algae are also being used to create packaging and straws, which are not just biodegradable, they're theoretically edible. Even in healthcare, some manufacturers are finding ways to use waste products from sugarcane and compressing those into trays, bowls, dishes, and skin staplers for use in surgery. All of these developments are super exciting, but to see them really take off, we need some economic rejiggering. Policy approaches like the UN Plastics Treaty are a great start. Many of the comments on Fernandez's LinkedIn post had a yes but kind of response that's very common in the sustainability realm. I don't know if this attitude comes from a bit of ego-related turf wars, or maybe some folks are misrepresenting themselves as voices of sustainability, but are really working for other embedded corporate interests. Whatever the case, thankfully, there were a few comments that had more of the yes and attitude. With these complicated tangled topics in sustainability, there are no simple solutions, no silver bullets, and no magic pills. Likewise, no one person will have the full perspective on the issue which is why we need all voices at the table to talk through solutions. The UN's COP conference going on right now in Azerbaijan and the upcoming UN-INC plastic treaty discussion are steps in the right direction. And there are so many steps beyond these. What would I comment on Fernandez's post? Something like this. I'm so glad you are bringing this to everyone's attention. I'm so grateful for the many people, companies, and governments trying to address this issue. And yes, large companies like the Mars Corporation need to be doing more to support the transition to a sustainable future. Let's all do what we can.
Thank you for listening. If you want to embrace the adventure of climate action, subscribe to our podcast and check out our Love and Guilt in the Anthropocene blog at clinicallysustainable.substack.com.